participated in the Catholic Church as the only way for uh, responsible choices in reproduction. And although homosexual acts are still declared evil, homosexuals as such, that is, individuals who identify their sexual orientation as being toward those of the same sex, are not considered evil. And even homosexual acts may be good subjectively, if not objectively. You want me to explain that at some point, I'll be happy to do so. But let me turn now to focus briefly on same-sex relations as a kind of casing point in the development of Christian teachings uh, in sexual ethics. So long as the Christian tradition continued to justify sex primarily as a means for the procreation of children, or sex in marriage primarily as a corrective to disordered sexual desire, there was little room for any positive valuation of same-sex relationships and sexual activity. It would seem to follow, therefore, that when these per perspectives were modified, a new and more positive Christian position on gay and lesbian relationships would emerge. In other words, we don't believe anymore that all sex has to be procreated, biologically procreative, and every uh, relation, sexual relationship has to be heterosexual. If that is no longer a flag that is waved always and everywhere, then it should make some difference. We have new biological insights, psychological insights, philosophical insights, and theological insights that the conclusions that were drawn in past centuries are not necessarily the conclusions to be drawn now. So it would seem to follow that when these other pers older perspectives were modified, a new and more positive Christian position on gay and lesbian relationships would emerge. This has happened for many, though of course not all, of the faithful and the clergy in all Christian denominations and in the writings of the majority of Christian ethicists, but not as yet in some official church teachings. For example, despite the important shifts that I've just described in the Roman Catholic tradition, there is minimal change in official teachings regarding homosexuality. This is true also of some Protestant traditions as well. The procreative norm has been relativized for heterosexual relations but it returns when homosexual relations are at issue. That is, people generally accept that the procreative norm is not the only norm in heterosexual relations, but as soon as you start talking about same-sex relations, here it is, it's back again. The view of sexuality as fundamentally disordered is gone for heterosexual sex, but it reappears as strong as ever in some people's judgments about gay and lesbian sex. Rigid stereotypes of male-female complementarity are softened for general social roles, but the importance of general complementarity becomes the final strike, the last bastion against the acceptance of same-sex relations. How might we adjudicate the current profound debates on these issues. Well, we've come a long way, just in the last few years. <clears throat> and I, I'm not sure it's because everybody thinks these th things through. My, my conviction is there's hardly a family, at least in the United States, that does not have among their members or their extended family or their friends or their children's friends someone who is gay or lesbian. And since they know those persons, I'm not saying everybody goes in this direction, but since many finally say, but this is someone who's a good person and who's an intelligent person, not just making stupid mistakes, and whom I love, that is the major, major 
uh, drive behind the change in acceptance of same-sex relationships. But how might we adjudicate if we think about these matters? What insights are important in discerning, both as individuals and as members of church communities, how to think about these matters? When Christians look for light on any ethical questions, they turn to basic sources. Scripture, tradition, in the sense of the history of Christian belief, discernible in the teachings and practices of the churches and in the history of Christian theology, and secular disciplines of knowledge, in this case, for example, in philosophy and the biological and behavioral sciences, and four, so I'm saying four sources, scripture, tradition, in the sense I just described, secular disciplines where we learn a lot about sexuality and relationships, and the fourth source is contemporary experience. In the time I have here, I can't rehearse the multiple findings and interpretations that scholars now provide for these sources, but let me touch on them briefly. So first, regarding the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the sacred scripture, in other words. Particular texts on homosexuality, as countless biblical scholars have shown, all offer problems for both exegesis, that is, explaining, uh, uh, providing historical analysis of relevant texts. So there are problems. The, the scriptures have to be exegeted. They also need to be interpreted. What did they mean? What do they mean? Now, and, and we have to make decisions about how to use them once we've exegeted them and interpreted them. <laughs> so that, uh, you, many of you are students here or elsewhere and so on, you, you know the struggle over texts. And, um, and the reason there's a struggle is because there are frankly quite contradictory texts in the sacred scriptures. So what to do with them? How to make sense of them? How to apply them to our lives, etc. Whether because of ambiguity in the use of rhetorical devices in the writings in scripture, or disparity between the meaning of homosexual sexuality in biblical times and now. For example, when the biblical texts were written, there was absolutely no concept of sexual orientation. When there was a condemnation of same-sex relations, it was because they took it for granted that everybody was heterosexual, and here were some people who were oversexed, so they also had sex with those of, their, of the same uh, orientation. So no notion of orientation or of the possibility of long-term committed same-sex relationships. Well, we can enter the battle of proof texts and diverse interpretations on either side, or we can stand before the biblical revelation as a whole. Either way, I would argue that a modest conclusion, at least, is warranted. That is, that the biblical witness does not offer incontrovertible grounds for an absolute prohibition or a comprehensive blessing for same-sex relations. A modest conclusion. You can't get a total blessing out of scripture for same-sex relations. You cannot get an that a total prohibition of same-sex relations out of scripture. And I'll come back to that shortly. So what about tradition? The, tradition? the Christian tradition, too, requires exegesis and interpretation. Uh, just like scripture. I mean, Protestants struggle with biblical fundamentalism. Uh, exegesis, interpretation, work at it, work at it, work at it. The Catholic tradition needs to do the same thing with tradition. Exegete it, interpret it, decide what it means today. 
we can find in, in tradition, and not just the Catholic, all Christian traditions, occasional past absolute prohibitions of same-sex relations. But these are not consistent throughout the tradition. And where they appear, they are based on rationales that no longer appear persuasive today. For example, one of the great arguments throughout the tradition <coughs> has been that homosexuality is unnatural. And how do we know for sure it's unnatural in humans? Because it's unnatural in animals. Well, of course, now we know that it's not unnatural in animals, almost any animals. So, so that's a specious kind of argument. Now, you might say, well, but, but there are a lot of other. Well, all right, there are a lot. That's an example, though. That's an example. And a very, we have been very strong through tradition, especially if you have a natural law perspective. Hence, the rationales, at least, have been widely abandoned or changed. Those who want to perpetuate the prohibitions against same-sex relations will have to find new rationales. Hence, another modest conclusion can therefore be drawn. That is, just as it is certainly not possible to draw from the tradition at this point a comprehensive blessing on all same-sex relations, so it is not possible to draw an absolute prohibition. From secular disciplines, a third source, for example, genetics, anthropology, psychology, medicine, there is also too much disagreement to yield a final word, a last word, in the discernment of these questions. Although it must be said today that these disciplines now largely lean in direct directions that presume there is nothing about same-sex relationships as such that harms people, at least not in societies without <coughs> harmful bias and discrimination. What we have learned regarding, for example, the inadequacy and inaccuracy of stereotypical differentiation of gender characteristics, the injustice of rigid gender role differentiation, the harms imposed on those whose gender is ambiguous, at least gives us grounds to oppose discrimination against any people on the basis of gender or sexual orientation. And I would argue further to support their full incorporation into our human communities. The fourth traditional source for moral insight on moral questions is that of contemporary experience. In regard to same-sex relationships, we have important voices to be listened to. That is, we do have available the testimony of women and men whose sexual experience is with others of the same sex. By itself, experience does not provide an incontestable foundational deposit of insight. It cannot be used to establish an anything-goes conclusion based on, well, this is my experience, it must be good. It's, that's not how experience serves as a source. But for some ethical questions today, concrete contemporary experience is a primary source able to be tested in significant ways. For example, in terms of the integrity of those whose experience is being shared. Same-sex relations which today presents one of these questions. All of this leads me to conclude that we need to change the question most commonly asked in sexual ethics about same-sex relationships. What we should be asking is not whether same-sex relations can be morally justified, but rather when they can be justified. That is, under what conditions, according to what ethical criteria, will same-sex relationships be morally good? This, of course, is the same question we must ask about heterosexual relations. 
So I turn then to my third consideration, which is, is there a framework for contemporary Christian or human sexual ethics that will help us to discern questions such as this one, as well as many others? A framework that will assist us in discerning when any sexual relationship or activity is appropriate and morally good. So I turn to the framework. <clears throat> I'm going to summarize some of these things. Um, I want to say, uh, when I began to think of a framework for sexual ethics, <clears throat> I was reminded of something that the philo French philosopher Paul Ricoeur said in an early work of his entitled Symbolism of Evil. Ricoeur was trying to trace the history in Western civilization of how we symbolize evil. And he identified three stages. Uh, not necessarily that they went from one to two to three, but that back and forth and so on, that were recognizable historical phases. And uh, he called the first phase of the symbolism of evil <coughs> defilement. We had symbols of defilement, dirtiness, contagious evil, etc. Uh, the second stage he called uh, he, uh, he called sin. <clears throat> what he meant by sin was, uh, unlike defilement uh, and its forms of symbolism, which uh, he described as pre-ethical, irrational, quasi-material, something that infects by contact. That's, those are the symbols of defilement. Uh, unlike those symbols, the second stage, which he called sin, was uh, defined by Ricoeur as now not that dirtiness, etc., but rather as the breakdown in a relationship, whether between human and God or humans and one another. The third stage, Ricoeur called guilt, and by this he meant a breakdown of a relationship as a result of my free choice. Well, what does any of this have to do with sexuality? Ricoeur observed just in passing at one point that although we no longer think in general of moral evil primarily in terms of defilement, yet in the sexual sphere, the tendency to equate sexuality with defilement still clings to our collective psyche, our collective unconscious. In other words, the sense of defilement in connection with sexuality is not easily left behind, and an inarticulable but persistent tie between sexuality and evil remains deep in the symbol structure of the West. Now if you say, oh, I don't think so anymore, anymore. Think about, think about the scandals among politicians that hit the headlines. Not the fact that they um, didn't have enough sense to pay any attention to the most needy people in the society, etc. Not that they didn't, uh, or business persons, didn't make millions and millions of dollars off the backs of of the poor through deception and so on. What we would say, the most serious evils, those don't hit the headlines. What hits the headlines is somebody got caught in adultery with somebody else. Now, I'm not saying that th that shouldn't be judged. I'm just saying, why is that? Because the drama of sexuality still, still has attached to it uh, a sense of a kind of defilement. Hence, a necessary step in the formulation of a contemporary sexual ethics must be to move sexuality more completely from the realm of the pre-ethical to the ethical. This fear of defilement is pre-ethical. It's a taboo morality. By definition, taboos don't have to have a rationale. Something terrible will happen to you if you do this. That's what a taboo is. 
We have to move sexuality out of that realm primarily into the realm of the ethical. The blind sense of defilement must be subjected to relentless criticism and responsible repudiation. A sexual ethic may be achieved not only from thinking about sex and sexuality, but by turning first to the non-sexual spheres of human existence, to the spheres of work, economics, politics, to discern what justice means in human relationships. In other words, if we just keep looking at sex, 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 we have so much baggage that we can't get clear as to what is simply a taboo and what really makes sense as an obligation or as a prohibition. But if we look to the other spheres of human life and we say, this is what justice means in human relationships, then turn back to the sexual sphere, we can ask, what does justice mean in sexual relationships? The kind of analysis that my reading of this brief passage in Rapport led to is beyond the scope of what we can do here right now, although this is the basis of a lot that is in my book. And in any case, even here, I nonetheless want to ask what a justice ethic for sexual relations might entail. This may, be, may turn out to be only preliminary to a more adequate sexual ethic, but it has the advantage of moving sexuality away from a taboo morality without ending up with nothing, a contentless ethic of so-called love. It will not do, it seems to me, as some wish to end all ethical discernment by simply saying that sexual relations and activities are good when they express love. Why not? Well, because love is the problem in ethics, not the solution. There are, we have wise loves and foolish loves, good loves and bad, true loves and mistaken loves, just loves and unjust loves. So the question ultimately is, what is a right love? What is a good love? What is a wise and just love? The articulation of norms of justice will begin to answer this question, I suggest for these will be the norms of a just love. Justice, of course, can mean many things. I've got to go faster here now. I'll stop saying things in between. But um, justice can mean many things. I'm using the most simple, basic meaning of it. To be just is to give to each his or her due. To give to someone what is their due. And that means, in this context, that uh, we have to take into account the concrete reality of human persons to understand what is due, including in the sexual dimensions of our being. The formulation of specific principles of justice depends on our interpretation of the concrete reality of all creation, but right now we're talking about of human persons. And that's that's hard to do, and I can't go into that in any greater length here now. And we know that our understandings, interpretations of what it means to be a human for love, it is socially constructed. All of that is true. Nonetheless, there are basic things that we perceive, that we understand, that we are convinced about, the dignity of one another, for example, that, uh, uh, that motivates and that gives a rationale to our affirming for persons what is their due. I'm skipping some things now so that, uh, now, so I'm saying, I'm beginning in a way with abstractions, uh, but I, I, what is due other persons includes some kind of account of persons' basic needs and capacities, their individual histories, their age, their cultural formation, institutional relationships, personal commitments, obligations, and so on. So in the face of interpreting that among ourselves, for ourselves, what might a justice ethic look like in regard to sexuality? Well, I'm going to just jump in. What it means to be a person, uh, 
It's very complex, but I'm going to say there are two aspects of being a person that can help to undergird a sexual ethics. Uh, the first aspect is what we call the capacity for free choice or autonomy. And the second is what today we call relationality or the capacity for relationships. Now, why would I start there? That's still very abstract. But if I say, uh, what is it about you uh, that, that, that calls upon me to respect your dignity as a person? Well, one of the things about you that demands from me respect for you is that you have a capacity to make free choices. Now, why? what's the connection? A capacity for free choice, uh, autonomy, is a capacity for self-determination, for better or for worse. We can choose, to some extent, our own destinies. Well, what does that, it means that, if that's true, I mean, within limits and so on, of course, but if that's true, then if I violate your capacity for self-determination, I violate you and your dignity. And why is that? Because the fact that we choose, it's not that God doesn't call us to a certain destiny, but uh, we have the capacity to say yes. And um, that means that if you respect me, you cannot anymore treat me as a pure means to your ends. Why? Because if I have a capacity for choice, I have a capacity as, as an end in herself. I may ruin it, I may what, whatever. But it, right, am I going so succinctly that it is not making sense or you, you get it anyway? It, it'll show up again. Uh, the other aspect, relationality, the same thing. It is what is true about us that makes us ends, not just means. Why? What does relationality mean in this sense? It means the capacity to come into relation by knowledge and love with all that is knowable and lovable. I mean, we don't, ex we don't, don't exhaust that capacity. We have a quasi-infinite capacity to come into relation with all that is known, knowable and lovable. A capacity to come into relation where we know and are known, where we love and are loved. That is like being a whole world in ourself. And a whole world when we place ourselves in one another's hearts. That is to be an end, not just a means. So those two two things. Now, from here I'm going to go immediately to, I think, can you hear me if I talk loud now? Yes. All right. So now what might be norms of justice in a sexual ethics? And I say, well, here's one. We have autonomy or, and relationality, which I've been just talking about. Those aspects of human persons that makes us ends in ourselves. Yes, we're means to one another, but not means only. We are to be respected in ourselves, uh, the dignity of a human person. These two aspects of being a person, which make us ends in ourselves, um, give us our first, our first norm for sexual ethics, which is, do no unjust harm. I say unjust, but I don't say do no harm. We, we're always harming people, and sometimes we have to because it helps them. Uh, surgery is a good, a good example. But um, do no harm that unjustly violates the personhood of another. That's the first, the first norm. Uh, but it's not enough. It's way too general. I mean, it's, you can get some very, uh, very explicit uh, ex uh, examples of what it could mean. 
I mean, do no harm in a way echoes through the experience of the command, do not kill, ultimately. In the sexual sphere, there are many forms that harm can take, physical, psychological, spiritual, relational. Here, each person is vulnerable in ways that go deep within. As inspirited bodies and embodied spirits, we're vulnerable, all of us, to sexual exploitation, battery, enslavement, negligence, and to deceit, betrayal, being shamed, stigmatized, barred from human community by exclusionary practices of gender. Do no unjust harm goes a long way toward specifying a sexual ethic, but not far enough. We need additional norms to specify that primary norm. So my sexual, uh, my, my next second norm, I'm going to draw from this aspect of our personhood, our capacity, our capacity for free choice, and it's uh, almost self-evident. The second norm is free consent. No sex without free and mature consent. This norm sets a minimum but absolute requirement for free consent of sexual partners. This means, of course, that rape, violence, or any use of power against unwilling willing victims is never justified. And seduction or manipulation of persons who have limited capacity for choice because of age or immaturity or some special dependency or loss of ordinary power is ruled out. You can't do those things to those persons. In requiring respect for the choice of each partner, this norm requires respect for bodily integrity. It opposes sexual harassment, pedophilia, and other instances of the violation of persons. It also means that other ethical princes, principles such as principles of truth-telling and promise-keeping are fundamental to an adequate sexual ethic. Why? Because whatever other rationales can be given for those principles, their violation hinders the freedom of choice of the other person. So I could add, I could specify this, including various things that this requirement for free choice rules out or rules in, but lying and, and breaking promises is included. If I lie to you, for example, how does that violate your capacity for free choice? I lie to you, you believe me, you take action on, I, on, the, on the, what you've heard in my lie, I'm coercing you. I'm limiting your choices. Similarly, promise keeping. Now, I'm not talking here right now about we all make promises that we sometimes can't keep or can't keep well. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about promises that are articulated knowing that I'm not going to keep the promise. So it's deceptive. And you act on that, I'm totally limiting your free choice and harming you in a particular way. All right, uh, now I'm going to, all my other norms, this first norm takes into account both the capacity for free choice and relationality. This one I'm basing on the capacity for free choice. And uh, I'm just moving over here. I don't All my other norms are going to be drawn from uh, respect for relationality. So, relationality is, it seems to me, equally primordial and important with autonomy as a feature of human personhood. Individuals do not just survive or thrive in relation to others. We cannot exist without some form of fundamental relatedness to personal others. Now, sexual activity and sexual pleasure are instruments and modes of relation, including relation to self. They can enhance relation or hinder it. 
contribute to it and express it or distort it. They are optional goods, sexual pleasure, sexual activity. They are optional goods in the sense that they're not absolute, peremptory goods which could never be subordinated to other groups or for the sake of other goods be let go. But they are very great goods, mediating relationality and the general well-being of persons. Insofar as one person is sexually active in relation to another, sex must not violate relationality, but serve it. Another way of saying this is that it is not enough, either in a general sense, not to harm sexual partners, or even more specifically, to respect the free choice of sexual partners. We need further sexual norms having to do with relationality. My third norm, then, is mutuality. Now that sounds like a nice soft term and so on, but I mean more of it than that. <coughs> Respect for persons together in sexual activity requires mutuality of participation. This, of course, can be expressed in many ways but it entails activity and receptivity on the part of both persons. And you say, well, what else is new? But the model, remember, whether in Judaism or Christianity, the model, the structure of sexual relations was one active, the other passive. That was the model. And it still is in some people's minds. Today, if you have one wholly active, the other wholly passive, I would guess we'd call that rape. So activity, receptivity on the part of both, both active, both receptive, actively receptive, receptively active, that kind of mutuality of participation. This, of course, can be expressed in many ways, but it entails activity and rep receptivity on the part of both. Mutuality, therefore, of desire, of action, and of response. Now, a qualification I usually make before I get to some of these norms is, these norms are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They overlap. Similarly, they admit of degrees. We never have perfect total freedom. We never have perfect total mutuality, or hardly ever, in a life of relationship. But it is important to be able to discern a threshold beyond which this sexual activity, desire, and love will be unjust. This leads to yet another norm. Freedom and mutuality are not sufficient to respect persons in sexual relationships. A condition for real freedom and a necessary qualification of mutuality is equality. Equality. Or we don't perhaps ever even have total, perfect equality, but to some degree, equality. <clears throat> the equality that is at stake here is equality of power. Major inequities in social and economic status, age and maturity, professional identity, etc., render sexual relations inappropriate and unethical, primarily because they entail power inequalities, therefore unequal vulnerability, unequal dependency, and limitation of options. The requirement for equality rules out treating a partner as property, as a commodity, as an element in market exchange, or as a mere instrument for one's own pleasure. 
Now this has to do with all that we've learned in recent years about sexual harassment, for example. Whoever thought of that before? Whoever thought about that? That's a whole new concept. I come from a university setting. Uh, professors and teaching assistants, they all had partnerships, or, uh, uh, romantic relationships. I'm, I'm not saying they all, everybody was running around having a romantic relationship. But frequently there were questionable relationships. They were great when they turned out fun, but they were terrible when they did not. And that has to do with the inequality. A professor has power over a student, etc. And you can think of that in other spheres as well. Strong arguments can, I think, be made for another, a fifth norm, specifying respect for relationality. And this is the norm of commitment. Now this is the, this is the hard one for many people. So let me just say a little bit about what I mean. At the heart of, because I do not mean a marriage license in every respect. <clears throat> At the heart of the Christian community's understanding of the place of sexuality in human and Christian life has been the notion of some form of commitment, some form of covenant, that this must characterize relations that include a sexual dimension. In the past, this commitment, of course, was identified with heterosexual marriage, period. It was tied to the need for appropriative order and a discipline for unruly sex. Even when it was valued in itself as a realization of the life of the church in relation to Jesus Christ, it carried what today are unwanted connotations of inequality in relations between women and men. It is possible, nonetheless, that when all the meanings of commitment for sexual relations are sifted, we are left with powerful reasons to retain some form of commitment as an ethical norm. Why? Well, first, there's an obvious reason, to protect the vulnerability of each partner. But there is another reason as well. Contemporary understandings of sexuality point to different possibilities for sex that may have been central in the past. That is, the possibilities of growth in the human person, the gathering of creative energies, the integration of the person, and the realization of these possibilities precisely through commitment, including sexual commitment. One of the central insights from contemporary ethical reflection on sexuality is that norms of sexual justice cannot have as their whole goal to set limits to the power and expression of human sexuality. Sexuality needs to be nurtured, sustained, as well as disciplined, channeled, and controlled. One way to do this is to extend a human relationship sufficiently through time to allow the incorporation of sexuality into a shared life and an enduring love. At the very least, it may be said that while brief encounters may open a lover to relation, they cannot mediate the kind of union of knowing and being known, loving and being loved, for which human relationality offers the potential. What commitment does for a relationship is to give it a future and a past, a time between in which it can learn the ways of trust, faithfulness, forgiveness, and hope. A sexual ethic, then, may importantly identify at least some form of commitment as a norm for sexual relations and activity. Given a concern for wholeness, for nurturing sexual desire and love into a tenderness that has not forgotten passion, for aspiring to the highest forms of friendship, the norm seems to be a committed love. <clears throat> My sixth and final norm 
derivative also from our understandings of relationality, is, well, it is my final, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a self. <laughs> this one. This is fruitfulness. I can never write straight on, on a board. I never, I don't see it straight, so it comes out crooked, but you get the point. Um, while the traditional procreative norm of sexual relations and activity no longer holds absolute sway in sexual ethics, there remains special concern for responsible reproduction of the human species, i.e. biological reproduction. But beyond this, or apart from this, different from biological reproduction, beyond the kind of fruitfulness that brings forth <coughs> biological children, there is a kind of fruitfulness that is a measure, perhaps, of all interpersonal love. Love between persons violates relationality if it closes in upon itself and refuses to open to a wider community of persons. If it becomes what the French would call, it's just for the two of us, an egoism à deux. But the new life within it, this relationship, may move beyond it in countless ways, not only biological children, although that's very important, I'm not uh, in, in any sense meaning to minimize that, New life within a love, a partnership, may move beyond it in countless forms. For example, nourishing other relationships, providing goods and services for others, informing the work lives of the partners in relation, caring for other people's biological children, etc. All of these forms can be understood as the fruit of a love for which the persons in relation are responsible. Now I move to my last one, number seven. Uh, and it uh, takes us to a somewhat different perspective because my seventh norm, these norms all have to do with what individuals are doing, uh, together or alone or whatever. This is a norm of social justice. <coughs> social justice. There are obligations in justice which others in the community and the wider society have toward persons as sexual beings. Whether persons are single or married, gay or straight, they have claims to respect from the Christian community as well as the wider society. Claims to equal protection under the law, to self-determination, to a share in the goods, goods and services available to all. Their needs for incorporation into the community, for psychic security, for basic well-being, make the same claims for social, cooperat social cooperation among us as do those of us all. This last norm, in other words, obligates not only individuals in a relationship, but wider communities and society. So, in conclusion, what I've tried to offer here is a framework for sexual ethics based on norms of justice, those norms which govern all human relationships and those which are particular to the intimacy of sexual relations. Christians and others, no doubt, they want to specify more fully such norms as faithfulness, forgiveness, patience, hope, which are essential for relationships between persons, especially within faith communities and in experienced relationship with God. If I may, I'll take just one moment to return to the question of my case in point, gay and lesbian relations, and say this, what I am suggesting is that these norms or ethical principles for a just love in sexual relationships are the same norms for heterosexual and for homosexual relations. Neither heterosexual 
nor same-sex relations can be automatically justified or condemned. Both have criteria for moral justification. And as far as I can see, these criteria, these norms, are the same for both. More specifically, we can say that sex between two persons of the same sex, just as between two persons of the so-called opposite sex, should not be used in a way that harms, exploits, objectifies, or dominates one's partner. Freedom and integrity are values to be affirmed in every same-sex as heterosex relationship, as are the values of mutuality, equality, commitment, and fruitfulness. This leads also to the conclusion that just as gays and lesbians can and must claim social justice from their society in terms of non-discrimination in employment, housing, etc., and security against violent attack or prejudice to their participation in society's organization, so gays and lesbians can claim justice from their churches in support of themselves and their efforts at commitment. They can be faithful, fair, fruitful, and sharers in a sacred life of grace with a right to the treasures of revelation, the good news of divine revelation, and the sacred rituals that will help them to sustain their relationships and their loves. It is not an easy task to introduce considerations of justice into every sexual relation and the evaluation of every sexual activity. Critical questions remain unanswered, and serious disagreements are all too frequent regarding the concrete reality of persons and the meaning of sexuality. What is harmful and what helpful to individual persons and societies is not always clear. What can be normative and what exceptional is sometimes a matter of all too delicate judgment. But if sexuality is to be creative and not destructive in personal and social relationships, then what I've been trying to say is there is no substitute for discerning ever more carefully the norms whereby it will be just. To ask again and again and again, but is it just, is it just, is it just? Thank you.